Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. About 55 million years ago, the Earth basked in positively sweltering temperatures not seen since the Paleozoic. It is rather amusing that many people imagined the Age of Dinosaurs as a time of vast impenetrable jungles and unending equatorial climes. However, the Mesozoic was actually punctuated by a number of cooler intervals, which caused some parts of the planet to become a little chilly. In fact, there were no jungles in the Cretaceous, at least not in the way we tend to think of them today. By the end of the Paleocene, however, much of the world was covered in tropical forests that almost matched the stereotypical image of the distant prehistoric past. Of course, on our Earth, there were no non-avian dinosaurs dwelling in these hothouse conditions. On Alter Earth, things panned out a bit differently. After 10 million years of recovery in the Paleocene, the dinosaurs had regained much of the ground lost during the end Maastrichtian extinction event. Indeed, the transitional period between the Paleocene and the Eocene saw a rapid proliferation of animal groups, both old and new. No doubt assisted by the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, dinosaur diversity rose to levels last seen during the Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous. Great herds of hadrosaurs and ceratopsids moved through the dense forests, feeding on the rich array of plant life growing in the understory. Unlike in Eurasia, sauropods were absent in Eocene North America. Instead, the high browser niche was taken here by members of the Lambiosaurine tribe, Parasaurolophini, that had migrated to the Americas circa 54 million years ago. Throughout the Eocene, these animals would become the largest ornithischians ever to evolve, with the genus Titanolophosaurus measuring up to 19 metres in length and weighing up to 20 tonnes. All of the smaller North American Eocene hadrosaurs were members of the Saurolophinae, Living alongside the duckbills were the even more numerous ceratopsids. Indeed, the advanced horned dinosaurs were the most common large herbivores in North America. Vast herds of chasmosaurine ceratopsids blanketed the open fields and glades sandwiched between the great stands of tropical forest that covered much of the continent. Aside from several miscellaneous genera, most Eocene ceratopsids belonged to the Specios family Uinterceratopsinae, these dinosaurs were highly successful. First appearing in the early Eocene, members of Uinterceratopsinae soon spread to Asia and would go on to produce 40 genera or so over the course of the Eocene. Rather less commonplace were the smaller Leptoceratopsids, but a handful of genera have been uncovered from early Eocene deposits. Their time was yet to come. On a related note, the Eocene marked the arrival of basal Hippogryphoidians in North America. These tiny, very basal ceratopsians evolved from Plenoceratops mirabilis in late Paleocene Asia and underwent a massive diversification event at the beginning of the Eocene. The first family in this lineage were the Hystricosaurids, small bipedal omnivores covered in protective spines. The oldest member of this family in North America Echinoceratops integer is known from a remarkably complete specimen found in the Lagostate of the Green River Formation, Wyoming. Smaller herbivores, while rather rare, were present in force. Chief among these were the Rhododromids, which were already a diverse group during the Paleocene. This theme continued into the early Eocene, with these speedy little animals continuing to spread and multiply across the entire northern hemisphere. While most rhododromids were similar in size and ecological niche, by the Middle Eocene, a new family would branch off from the rest, the Ziphosauridae. Meanwhile, the chunkier cousins of the rhododromids, the Thessalosaurids, were following a different path. Trading in speed for increased size, bulk and semi-aquatic habits, this family was quite common during the early Eocene. Like many other dinosaur groups, the Thessalosaurians spread from their North American homeland to Asia and beyond at this time. Also present were the Pachycephalosaurs. Although not especially numerous, this group was quite diverse, ranging from the large, derived ornatotholids to the tiny, tragosauroid descendants of Megasaurus. 
Examples of the latter include the Paleocerotidae family, small, fast herbivores with two short squamosal horns, and the endemic American Presidioceratidae. Moving on to the theropods, a significant event that took place in the early Eocene was the spread of Asian oviraptorids into North America. Like many other groups of dinosaurs at this time, oviraptorids underwent a significant radiation during the Eocene. The ancestors of all modern representatives of this family, and then some, appeared at different stages throughout this period. In the early Eocene, most North American oviraptorids did not belong to established families, but instead formed a grade leading up to more derived groups. However, the first members of the long-lived Brontavids appeared in the early Eocene of Wyoming. Although later becoming quite large, up to 7 metres long, early forms such as Wasatchia and Bidensaurus were only 2 metre long generalists. Canaanathids were also present, being larger, faster and more herbivorous than the newly arrived oviraptorids, although none were closely related to living forms. The Eocene also saw the appearance of the Cassowary Mimids, a widespread family of ornithomimosaurs. These derived animals were adapted for an omnivorous diet and dwelt in the extensive forests that covered much of the northern hemisphere. A defining feature of this group was their unusually short arms, a trait that made these ornithomimosaurs resemble the emus and cassowaries of our Earth. However, early forms only possessed a very moderate reduction in forelimb size. The reasons behind this novel development are not well understood at present, but this most likely pertains to a shift in diet. Late Cretaceous ornithomimosaurs had slightly hooked claws, which suggests that they were used for browsing on leaves. It is possible that cassowary mimids, like their own earth namesake, began to utilise the growing numbers of fruit-bearing plants that diversified during the Eocene. Evidence for this is scant, however, as the fossils of fruit and seed-bearing angiosperms are very rare in Eocene deposits. Perhaps the cassowary mimids fed on a mixed diet of invertebrates, small animals, fungi and the occasional tasty morsel of fruit, although more fossil evidence is needed to confirm this. Other theropods were also experimenting with novel evolutionary pathways in the early Eocene. Troodontids in North America had split into two lineages by this time. The first and more conventional subfamily were the Troodontines. These nimble, omnivorous and crepuscular animals were, quite obviously, descendants of Troodon itself and greatly resembled that genus in size and lifestyle. The second group, however, could not have been more different. They were so odd that paleontologists have debated whether or not they should be classified as a troodontid subfamily or as their own completely new family. Regardless of this matter, the Nothrosaurids, or Nothrosaurines depending on classification, inhabited the high browser niche left vacant by the extinction of the Therizinosaurs at the end of the Maastrichtian. Descending from a Troodon-like ancestor, these dinosaurs became increasingly large and herbivorous over time. From the late Paleocene Phytodontosaurus onwards, adaptations for browsing, large size and progressively stockier limbs became hallmarks of this group. This suite of anatomical traits made the Nothrosaurids very successful, eventually spreading to Asia by the late Eocene and only becoming extinct during the Middle Miocene. A further important development that took place during the Middle Eocene was the appearance of toothless, beaked troodontids. The oldest and most basal of these, so far as we can tell, was the genus Nodontoraptor top mani from Colorado. It is interesting to note that this animal was already fully toothless and somewhat derived, suggesting that more basal forms are waiting to be discovered in older strata. It was from these putative ancestors that the wildly successful Rinco rostra clade emerged, although the true golden age of this group would begin during the Oligocene. However, not all theropods had to radically change their diet or ecological niche to thrive in the Eocene. Both Tyrannosaurids and Dromaeosaurs had hardly changed since the late Cretaceous, clearly demonstrating the effectiveness of their body plans. 
Indeed, Tyrannosaurids would continue to dominate the role of apex predator in North America until the early Miocene. As was the case with T. rex, big tyrannosaurs appear to have been the only large predators in their ecosystems. The next largest carnivores, oftentimes dromaeosaurs and oviraptorosaurs, were usually only half their size. This success led to a relatively small number of genera with wide temporal and geographic ranges. For example, the early Eocene Dynamo Tyrannus has been discovered all across the American West in rocks dated between 55 and 43 million years ago. In addition to this, Tyrannosaurs occupied pursuit predator niches during their juvenile stage, further cementing their stranglehold on the dinosaurian predatory role. A noteworthy sister family of the Tyrannosauridae began to diversify in the early Eocene. The Simo Tyrannosaurids, which had first appeared during the late Paleocene, were smaller than their Tyrannosaurid cousins and were primarily adapted for scavenging. The Simo Tyrannosaurids are defined by their shortened, robust skulls and stocky bodies. While the Tyrannosaurs continued to thrive in the role of apex predator, the Dromaeosaurs went from strength to strength in the small to medium sized ambush hunter niches. From the start to the end of the Eocene, there were three major lineages of these animals in North America. The largest and most impressive of these were the Boreoraptorians, derived from the Dromaeosaurian subfamily. These three to seven meter long predators stalked the tropical forests that covered much of the Northern Hemisphere and were the bane of many herbivorous dinosaurs. Presumed prey items include Ornithomimosaurs, larger Oviraptorosaurs, Rhododromids and Thessalosaurids. A little lower down the food chain were the Velociraptorians, that is to say, the Dromaeosaurs descended from Velociraptor and Acoraptor. Velociraptorians were fairly small, ranging from 2 to 3 metres in length and 10 to 25 kilograms in weight, and appear to have occupied the role of generalist predators. Their leg proportions suggest that they were not particularly fast runners, instead preferring to ambush mammals, lizards and small ornithischians with short bursts of speed. The third and final Dromaeosaur group inhabiting Eocene North America were the Sauronithelestines. These were the smallest and rarest of the raptors, only measuring between 1 to 2 metres in length and hunting the smallest of vertebrate prey. Few complete specimens are known, but they seem to have been more cursorial than their larger cousins and would have actively chased down their prey. These adaptations would serve them well when conditions began to change at the end of the Eocene. Thank you for listening everyone. Next week I'll be covering some specific fossil sites from Eocene North America and the dinosaur faunas that are contained within them. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you again next week. Cheerio!